Mark 11 and verse 22. The Bible says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Father, we thank you for your presence. We, we thank you that God, devils that have been on our back, weights that have tried, to destroy us you have spoken they have been lifted and we thank you Lord that he who the Son has set free is free is free indeed ah Lord I thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people I pray and plead the blood of Jesus oh I speak by the authority of the Word of God I pray God pull the reins upon people's minds, Lord, and help us to get an ear to hear God for just a few moments. Oh, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Touch my mind, God. Let me speak, Lord, as simply a pen of a ready writer, God. I give glory, honor to you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Ah, come on, somebody just put your hands together and thank him. Ah, come on. Come on, put your hands together. But to thank him, you got to open your mouth. Uh, don't just thank him in your mind, but open your mouth and thank him. Ah, uh, come on, thank him, thank him, thank him. Ah, uh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Uh, God is stirring up something right now. Ah, robo reme roma. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. You may be seated. The text we look at today, I've referenced the same chapter verse, but I want to read it real quickly from the New King James Version of Mark eleven twenty three. Where Jesus says, from the New King, New King James Version translation, he says, for, for, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever. He says, I think of this verse and I'm reminded of a very familiar verse of Proverbs 18, 21. That simply says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. My thought and the subject from the verses that we read that I really feel, really feel strongly led of the Lord to preach on today it is simply you have something to say you have something to say as I was studying and preparing I mean I, I mean I was getting some stuff in all kind of scriptures and I, I was like man maybe this Lord and I said no just I said just stay here you get to study the word. I'm telling you, man, you, you get to getting into stuff and you get to re get revelation, understanding. And, uh, but the Lord said, just say to my people today, you have something to say. The passage before us today, it, it really magnifies and teaches us about the power 
of biblical faith. In this particular story, the disciples were amazed by this withered tree in verses 20 and 21. They caused Jesus, because of their amazement, to simply say, have faith in God. The emphasis of this command, have faith in God, is that God's people should have a deep, settled, consistent, ongoing confidence in God and who God is and what God has said and what God will do. This command, have faith in God, speaks of a constant communion, a prayer with God, dependence upon God, and obedience to God. When Jesus says, have faith in God. He is encouraging faith in several aspects of God's character, that being in God's person, in God's promises, in God's power, and in God's purposes. And clearly the text today deals with faith that we, the people of God, are expected to have in God as believers, as children of God, that say we know him and love him. In this text, Jesus and the disciples you, you, you read, you see that they were on their, way, on their way back from Bethany to Jerusalem. And they were very near to the Mount of Olives. Now, the text does not specifically say, but it appears likely that Jesus may have referenced to this Mount of Olives as he speaks these words. And Jesus declared that if his disciples had enough faith, believing in their heart without any doubt, they could say unto the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. And their request would be granted. Amen. Well, I am firmly convinced that God has the power. Now, I don't know what kind of God you serve. But the God I serve has power. Matter of fact, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And I'm convinced that God has the power to literally remove mountains. And our genuine faith in him can also move mountains. But Jesus, I, I believe, used this illustration of power that is available to us. To help us see that we can overcome obstacles in mountains in our lives and enjoy victory over defeat. You see, one of the greatest weapons that we have to combat the enemy of our soul, you know what that is? Your mouth. One of your greatest weapons is not your Facebook account. Not your cell phone, not your computer, not your iPad, not your Dell, HP. One of your greatest weapons that you have at your disposal to combat the enemy. What he's trying to do against you, your family, your children, your very being, is your mouth. Your words are what determine victory. Or defeat in many spiritual battles in your life. And so remember, remember that atmosphere is everything. And what you say is powerful. Therefore, don't give in and begin to say words with your mouth that make the devil think he winning. Don't give in to what you're going through. To use your mouth and open it and declare words in the atmosphere to make the devil think he winning. 
I mean, think about it. When Satan attacked a God-fearing man named Job in the Bible, in the Old Testament, he was after one thing. Job's words. You, you read the story, you'll notice in Job 1, chapter 1, Job chapter 1, Satan told God if he, he could ever be allowed to attack Job. And, and God destroyed everything that Job had. He could get Job to curse God. Mm -hmm. He was after his mouth. See, see you got to understand when satanic attack blasted Job's life. Job had to decide whether to open his mouth and curse God and die or open his mouth and bless God and live. I got to decide what I'm going to do right now. The power of my victory lies in my mouth. So therefore, will I open it and curse God and die? Amen. Amen. I want you to know that you, you got to decide, you, what comes out of your mouth. You got to decide what comes out of your mouth when you are engaged in the onslaughts of hell. You got to, and you got to decide what's going to come out of my mouth while I'm going through this trial right now. Amen. What's going to come out of your mouth when the temptation comes? What's going to come out of your mouth? When the enemy come in like a flood, will you open your mouth and curse God and die? Or will you open your mouth and bless the Lord and live? You know, the devil wants to choke out your breath. He wants to silence your voice and stop your witness. But there's nothing that brings defeat to the enemy more than the Holy Ghost filled child of God who learns to rejoice in God in the good times, in the bad times. See, some of your own time you know how to rejoice is in the good times. But you got to learn to rejoice in God in the bad times. you got to learn, I'm not just going to open my mouth when they sing in my favorite song. I'm not just going to open my mouth when things going good and everything going my way. I'm going to learn to bless the Lord at all times. Matter of fact, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. When the enemy trying to choke my voice and choke the breath out of my life, I got a choice to make. And I won't hell to know. I got something to say. I want hell to know I got something to say. Amen. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. I've got something to say. Amen. Now in this text, Jesus explained in Mark eleven twenty three, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Now, when I read this, I, 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 I instantly thought about the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And you have to understand what the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says. This is the word of the Lord that was prophesied to Zerubbabel. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, see, we've always just focused on that verse. But you have to see verse 7. Because it goes on to say, Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shall become a plain. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, 
grace, grace unto it. Now, you have to understand for a moment that in Zechariah, Zerubbabel faced tremendous difficulties as he, as a man of God, sought to carry out the work of God that had been prepared beforehand for him to do. You see, the vision of Zechariah is a message to us and to him of encouragement. You see, Zechariah was the leader of the first return of the exiles from captivity. And under his leadership, Zerubbabel was working with people. He was working with the people of God to rebuild the temple of God. The temple foundation was quickly already laid. But because of political problems, the temple was never completed. And you have to understand that for 16 years, 16 years have now passed. And the temple is still not completed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the discouragement? Zacharubba, excuse me, Zerubbabel must have felt in trying to get people to work in the things of God for 16 years without any success. Can you imagine Zerubbabel working with the people of God, trying to lead them and help them, and they working for 16 years without any success? 16 years, let's, let's bring 16 years of rubble trying to build a church in the trenches, trying to build the work of God. But it looks like there's no success. Can you imagine the discouragement? What he must have felt? You, you know what you feel when you're working trying to do what you think you called to do for God? And it just seemed like it's just not getting off the ground. And he's not only trying to encourage himself, but he's trying to encourage the people. But the word of the Lord has now come to tell Zerubbabel that it is God's will to complete the work. Zerubbabel in this prophecy was given an assurance that he would complete the task in the work of would be finished that was set before him. But God said to Zerubbabel, it's going to be finished, but not by might. No power, but by my spirit. And the Lord proves his point in verse 7 by saying that the mighty mountain Zerubbabel that you face in shall be leveled to the ground. I feel like I'm preaching to somebody. There's some stuff in front of you. God says, listen, I'm getting ready to level what's in your way. I'm about to bring it down. But you got to understand what I'm getting ready to do is not going to be by power nor my might. Amen. But now before I really share with you this incredible powerful statement in verse 7, let, let me ask you a question. What mountains are in your way right now? What mountain is in your way? Whatever mountain is in your way, I want to tell you something. That mountain knows your voice. But can I tell you something? That mountain is not going to move until you open your mouth and use your voice by faith to change it. We got some mountains. We all facing some mountains. And your mountain know your voice. My mountain know my voice. But the mountain not going to move till you open your mouth and say something. You see, the preacher, the ministry, you know, people running around nowadays, I just go go to get so-and-so to pray for me. I got to get so-and-so to lay hands on me. Yeah, and thank God for the ministry and, and, and the laying on of hands. And that is important. But that alone is not going to move your mountain. Others can pray for you. And hopefully it will encourage you to get you to the point where you can muster up enough faith to speak and say something. Amen. But what does your mountain look like? 
I want to tell you about mountains that we face. Mountains that people face today is not the Mount of Olives. Mountains that we face today are mountains such as behavioral mountains. Did you know that behavioral patterns, bad behavioral patterns, will keep you from moving into the plan and purposes of God for your life. If you got bad behavioral patterns, those bad behavioral patterns will keep you outside the door of the promises of God for your life. Amen. You got bad behavioral problems of lying and stealing and cheating and drinking and getting drunk fornicating and committing adultery those bad behavioral patterns your bad temper your lying spirit those behavioral patterns that come from sin will keep you from moving into God's divine plan for your life Paul had behavioral mountains in his life that tried to stop God's plan for his life. Even Paul described it in Romans 7, verse 15, verse 17 and 20. Paul said in Romans 7, verse 15, he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Then he says in verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 18, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Then he goes on in verse 19, for the good that I would do not, for the good that I would do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Verse 20, now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin. Wait a minute, I know what's causing me to do what I'm doing. It's sin. That dwelleth in me. See, see, in these verses, Paul is saying that he does not even know why he's doing what he's doing. He said, I, I want to live right. I want to say the right things and do the right things. But before you know it, what happens is sin gets in the way. Amen. Let me tell you something. You see, you got to understand, sin will cause wrong behavioral issues in your life. If you keep sinning, your sins that you keep committing, that you refuse to stop doing, that God's dealing with you about doing something about, if you don't stop sinning, your sin... It's going to cause some real behave, behavioral issues in your life. Amen. But Paul had something to say. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.13, a portion of the verse, Paul said, I got something to say. And notice what he said. He said, I believed, therefore I've spoken. I believe, therefore I have spoken. Paul had something to say. Paul realized, Paul had something to say. He said in first, excuse me, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him that gives me strength. See, see, we got something to say. But to see, the issue is we've been saying all the wrong things. And you've been saying enough stuff to make the devil think he winning. Amen. What, what behavioral issues are you dealing with right now in your life? Amen. People are dealing with behavioral 
issues or behavioral mountains. But you got something to say to that behavioral mountain. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank God people can encourage you to change. And you've all had people who encourage you to change. But nothing changes. You just keep doing the same old thing. But I want to speak to someone and tell you, the mountain is never going to move until you put your faith in God and put your faith where your mouth is and speak to that situation. You're going to have to put your mouth where your money, put your money where your mouth is. You're going to have to say something. You're going to have to say something to that behavioral issue and mountain in your life. If your behavioral issue is lust, amen, there is an, a, a rise in today's world of the spirit of lust. And if your behavioral issue is love, that, that's your mountain, you're going to have to come to a place, you open your mouth and see the mountain already know your name. Know your voice. But you're going to have to speak to it. You can get everybody to pray for you. Lay hands on you. Encourage you. And that's good. But there come a point. You're going to have to open your mouth. And say, I'm coming to the altar. Because I'm opening in my mouth and I'm speaking to this mountain. You got to go. You got to go. This behavioral mountain that's causing now trouble, I feel the Holy Spirit, now causing trouble in my marriage. You got to go. Because if you don't deal with that behavioral issue, amen, it'll cause people to make you think you schizophrenic. Amen. Amen. You see, I, I believe we're in a world today where a lot of young people, children is coming up today. Particularly young people, children coming up in the church. A, a lot of these young people think their parents are schizophrenic. You say, why in the world was children that's growing up in the church think their parents are schizophrenic? They, they think you're schizophrenic because you come and shout in church and leap for joy, and then you go home cursing and all kind of foolishness. And they're thinking this is schizophrenic. Because how in the world they cursing at home and shouting and talking about leap for joy in church? Somebody is schizophrenic. How they talking about, I love my brother at church, but when they get home, I see mom and daddy on the telephone, on the cell phone, amen, running everybody down in the church. Is your children looking at you as rock solid or they looking at you as like you a schizophrenic? He said, Mama's schizophrenic. Because she run around shouting, talking about testifying, all this. Daddy, daddy something, something wrong with daddy. Oh, leap for joy, leap for joy. They looking at, I'm telling you, parents, we better live a life in front of our children. Amen. Because if you live in one way in church and another way at home, I'm telling you, your children looking at you like you're a spiritual schizophrenic. Let that just simmer for a bit. They looking at you, looking at, wait a minute, you, you're speaking in tongues at, at 1230 at church today. And you talking about your cup running over, and it ain't even it ain't even two thirty yet, and you cursing, cursing. You already know, you can tighten up if you want, but I'm I'm not gonna stop. Because I'm getting ready to deliver somebody from that spirit of schizophrenic. Amen. Amen. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. 
Oh, I, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Some parents think, oh, I hope my child don't turn around and look at me. And then if children turn around and look at mom and daddy, what you doing as a child? You know what your classmates looking at? If you talking about you go to church, let me tell you, if you going around in school acting a fool, don't tell them you go to Z-Top. Don't tell them you go to Z-Top. You going to school with all them hoochie mama clothes on? Don't tell them you going to Z-Top. I told you, if you want Kool-Aid, go to Food Line Hair Teeter. Because you ain't going to get no water down preaching here. Well, what are your children doing? Some of the kids, ooh, I'm glad he's talking about, talking about the parents. What, what are the kids doing? Ain't a band nothing mama telling you, daddy telling you. As rebellious as you want to be. Amen. If God spoke to you and told you to change certain things in your life, you wouldn't even listen to him. You so set in your ways. I would say, how did I get on this? But I know how I got on this. Amen. Amen. We got a responsibility as parents to train our children. Train them up in the way they're supposed to go. And if you acting a fool, cutting up, drinking in front of them, taking communion in front of them, Let me tell you something. It ain't the church's job to raise your kids. We gonna help you raise them. It's your responsibility. Cause see, it ain't my responsibility to pull my belt out and whoop their tail. Some parents need to learn the, 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 the scripture: spare the rod, spoil the child. The Bible said, beat the child, it won't die. This scripture. And you can get the weakest translation if you want, but it still means you need to discipline your children. Just giving them a look ain't going to cut it. You need to grab that rascal by the ear and pull him in front of everybody. We used to say, you want to cut up in public? We going to cut up in public. <laughs> Amen. Let me tell you something. Kids don't run the house. Kids don't run the house. I'm daddy. That's mama. We run the house. Sit your tail down for I beat you. nothing wrong with that sometimes you got to beat that rebellion out of them you hit me I call the police call them because if I go to jail when I get out you better hope Jesus has come because I'm going to find you God going to turn my GPS on. He going to turn my tracking system on. And see, you know, I don't need no belt to keep my pants up. Me and pull your pants up. 
Nobody want to see your dirty drawers. Pull your pants up. I might not finish this today. Let me deal with some mountains. Another mountain is financial mountains. Them mountains seem sometimes totally impossible. But let me tell you something. Financial mountains can also be related to and caused by behavioral mountains. In that they often build due to bad spending habits. It seems like no matter how hard you try, you just can't get on financially on track. People can help you. God can bless you. But until you are ready to speak to that mountain and see it removed, it's going to continue to stand in your way. It doesn't do anybody any good to say, somebody need to help me. Somebody need to pay the bills for me. Something, somebody need to do something. No, God waiting on you to do something. And at some point, you have to take ownership and say, my mountain only is going to respond to my voice. And it's time for me to speak to this mountain of debt. Get my life organized. I, I, get me a budget. Stop robbing God with my tithes and offerings. And get this thing straightened out. Amen. Amen. Some of you got financial mountains right now in front of you. I ain't talking about just bills. I'm talking about financial mountains. And a lot of them financial mountains is because of your behavioral mountains. Amen. But don't forget there's another mountain we face. Got to tell you, it's that emotional mountain. That, that emotional mountain that will sabotage your spiritual success. I'm talking about these emotional mountains that can develop in a person's life. Like they develop because of things like fear, anxiety, anger, and insecurity. Amen. And let me tell you something. People who face emotional mountains have a difficulty accepting the love of God. And yes, the enemy will strangle your life with emotional mountains. Jealousy is an emotional mountain. Fear is an emotional mountain. Hurt, abuse, abandonment is an emotional mountain. But those mountains will not go away until you open your mouth and say, you know what? I will not be insecure. I will not be unloving because people were unloving to me. You know what? I will not be jealous. I will not be angry and hateful as a person. Matter of fact, I will not be bitter because what people have done to me. No, I choose to say something and let the love of God change my heart. That these mountains can be flattened in my life. Whatever the situation may be, you got to let your voice be heard. They tell you you want to see change in society, in politics, the government. Let your voice be heard. And you need to know that the devil is like a python. He will come around you and choke out your breath and keep you from speaking to the mountains in your life so you can stay defeated. But you got something to say. I got something to say. But there's one other thing I got to touch on. There's another mountain. And that's that massive relational mountain that stands in a person's way. Let me tell you something. Staying tangled in a toxic, abusive, destructive relationship can steal years from a person's life. You can go to counseling. That's great. You can go to therapy. That's great. Which is good. But that mountain of wrong relationships is never going to get out of your life till you open up your mouth. And thank God for the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost that can cause faith to be quickened and revived and summons in one's life to speak to that specific battlefield and mountain in your life. Amen. 
We can overcome obstacles. If we practice believing God's word, if we practice opening our mouth, saying something by faith, praying out that thing by faith, something can happen. And, and I understand, I know that how we live in, I know some of you even here right now have gone through accidents, you've gone through earth-shaking tragedies and other terrible experiences. And, and I'm not even trying to minimize at all any of the things that you have gone through or the pain that has caused in your life. But after a while, you have to decide and say, I don't want to be a victim anymore I want this mountain moved you got to say you, you got to get one of those big old so what down in your spirit so what if they left you Jesus will never leave you or forsake you so what if they hurt you Jesus is your healer so what if that event stole from you and altered the course of your life and your abilities, so what? Through Jesus, you still can do all things. But it's time you say something. Some of you been saying so much stuff, the devil think he ain't won the Super Bowl. You ain't said so much, he don't even have to do no more. He think he winning because of what you saying. He winning because of what you saying. You got something to say, but some of you saying the wrong things. But the incredible thing, I got to bring this out and I'm closing. It's incredible. See, we always focus on Zechariah 4, 6. But four and seven is powerful. It's literally incredible. Because God calls the prophet to say to Zerubbabel that the mountains in front of him would be flattened in front of him if he would shout out grace to it. Ain't that what the scripture say? He says, shout out grace to it to it you got to understand this word grace in this text come from the Hebrew word hain and it literally means highly favored see when you got mountains to deal with in your life and it seems too big it seems like it's permanent it seems like it's representing pain from the past the best thing you can do is look at your mountain shout by faith I'm highly favored I'm highly favored. You as a child of God that's baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, striving to do the right thing, trying to do the best you can to please God, you can look at that mountain and say, I'm highly favored. You know what, matter of fact, mountain of discouragement, I'm highly favored. Mountain of debt, I'm highly favored. The prophet said, just say to it, grace to it. That word literally means highly favored. I'm highly favored. Amen. But you got to say something. You got to open your mouth. You know why people who constantly stay bound spiritually are normally the people who never say nothing. They never open their mouth. When it's time to praise the Lord, they just constantly looking around at everybody else. But you have something to say. But the question is, what are you going to say? The prophet prophesied to Zerubbabel, all I need you to do is say to the mountain, grace, grace to it. And, and notice he told him, this is not going to be power nor by might, but by my spirit. It's going to be because of what I tell you to do and you do what I tell you to do. That this mountain is coming down. We got something to say, church. But what are you going to say? Mountain of suicide, I'm highly favored. 
mountain of loneliness, one day God going to bring a loving spouse in my life. Amen. Amen. You got to speak to your mountain. That's what Jesus said. Don't just look at it. Speak to it. I speak to the mountain of my wayward children. They coming home. It's been 16 years now that Zerubbabel has been working, has seen no success. But God said, listen, I see your labor. And I'm going to tell you the secret to get this mountain moved out from, un out from, from, from among you, in front of you. You got to say something. You got something to say. But let's all stand. What are you going to say? And, and let me just share one other thing, and I'm closing. Hear me. Did you know that your voice, your voice, can move mountains? Your voice can activate angels. Did you hear what I said? Your voice can activate angels and the presence of God. I firmly believe God has angels assigned to you. They're ready. They're waiting to be dispatched at the sound of your voice. In fact, I believe the greatest tragedy of prayerlessness and not raising your voice is unemployment of angels. I mean, get this. When you look at the scriptures, the Bible said Jesus prayed and angels came to him in the garden. Paul prayed in the storm and the angels came to help him on the ship. The church prayed for Peter and the angels delivered him and set him free. And when I think about that, I just think and wonder how many of the angels assigned to your life are constantly standing in the unemployment line because you don't pray and raise your voice in faith. If you say nothing, if nothing goes up, nothing gonna come down. But I feel like God's calling somebody to step out of your seat and by faith say, I'm gonna open my mouth because I got something to say. I'm tired of this mountain in front of my life. I'm tired of looking at it, I'm tired of the weight of what this mountain has caused in my life. Come on, this is why the enemy wants to keep you dry, choke the life out of your voice that you say nothing. Come on, because when your voice is lifted, praise is unlocked. Come on, lift your voice. Come on. The power on our lips. The power on our lips. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.